we come to the floor um, with a heavy heart and great sadness. Geraldine Ferrero, a former member of the United States House of Representatives, uh, a congresswoman from New York, who was the first woman to be nominated by a major party for vice president, has lost her gallant and persistent fight against cancer and has passed away. I really thank uh, the leadership uh, for offering a resolution uh, noting the many contributions that she made to America and express the condolences for her family. Because you see, Mr. President, for we women, before 1960, Jerry was a force of nature, a powerhouse. She changed American politics. She changed the way women thought of themselves and what we believed we could accomplish. On July 11th, 1984, when Walter Mondale called Jerry Ferrero and asked her to be his vice presidential run running mate, an amazing thing happened. They took down the men only sign on the White House. They took down the men only sign on the White House. For Jerry and all American women, there was no turning back, only going forward. America knows Jerry as a political phenomenon. I knew her as a dear friend and colleague. We served in the House together in the late 1970s, and when she left in 1984 to run for vice president, I left in 1986 to run for the Senate. We were among the early bird women in the House of Representatives, and as early birds, we weren't afraid to ruffle some feathers. We had some good times and passed some good legislation. It must be historically noted that when Jerry came to the House in 1979, only 16 women were there. In 1984, when she left, my gosh, we had moved to 23. But in 2011, on the day of her death, 74 women now serve in the House. 50 Dems, 24 Republicans, and 26 of those women are women of color. In the Congress, Jerry was a fighter. She was a fighter for New York. She fought for transit. She fought for tunnels. And she loved earmarks, earmarks that would help move her community forward. She also fought for the little guy and gal. She was known for her attention to constituent services, the senior getting a social security check, the vet who needed his disability benefits, the kid from a blue collar neighborhood like herself who wanted to go for college, go to college. And she fought for women. She fought for our status and she gave us a new stature. When the campaign was over, she continued for all of her life to be a source of inspiration and empowerment for women. In those early days of the second wave of the American women's movement, the movement defined we women on what we did not have, what we did not have access to. What was it we didn't have? Equal pay for equal work. It's hard to believe that we were not included in the research protocols at NIH. And when it came to having access to credit, we could not get a loan or a mortgage in our own name in many circumstances. We needed a husband, a father, or a brother to sign for it. But when Jerry was chosen for vice president, she showed us what we could be, what modern women in America had become. Women felt if we could go for the White House, we could go for anything. Jerry inspired. And on the night of July 19th, 1984, in San Francisco, in the Moscone Center, Jerry gave her acceptance speech. She became the first woman to be nominated for vice president for a major party. What a night. I was there. The thrill, the excitement in the room, the turbo energy that was there, 10,000 people joined the, jammed the Moscone Center. Guy delegates gave their tickets away to either alternates, to their daughters, to people who worked and helped out. They wanted to be there. People brought their children. They carried them, they put them on their shoulders to see what was about to occur. And when Jerry Ferraro walked on that stage, she electrified all of us. The convention gave her a 10-minute standing 
and resounding ovation. We just couldn't sit down because we knew a barrier had been broken and for the rest, as she made history, there would be more on the way. During that campaign, it was hard fought. She traveled over 55,000 miles, visited 85 cities, campaigned her heart out, but it was not meant to be. The ticket lost to Reagan Bush, but though she lost the election, she did not lose her way. Jerry never gave up and never gave in. Her storied career continued, a teacher at Harvard, a UN ambassador on human rights, always teaching, always inspiring, always empowering thousands of women here and around the world. Then in 1998, she was diagnosed with blood cancer. And once again, she was determined not to give up and not to give in. She began the greatest campaign of her life. She began the campaign for her own life. She fought her cancer. And she not only fought her cancer, she also fought for cancer victims. She forged a relationship with Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson, as well as my friendship. You see, Senator Kay Bailey will tell this story herself. Her brother, Alan, Alan Bailey, suffered from the same disease as Jerry. They met through an advocacy group on multiple myeloma. And then they said, Alan Bailey and Jerry Ferrero joined hands and joined together, and, and Kay Bailey Hutchinson and I did, and we introduced the Jerry Ferrero Research Investment and Education Act. I wanted it to be Ferrero Bailey, but Alan very graciously said, Jerry's a marquee name, she'll attract a lot of attention, and we can get hopefully more money for research and more interest in this dreaded disease. That legislation passed, and it showed sometimes when we come together out of common adversity, we find common cause, and we, make, we get things done. That bill passed, and it is changing lives. Jerry did various clinical trials, and often we talked, and this is what she said to me during the last few weeks. She said, I'm glad I could be in those clinical trials. In many ways, they helped me live, but we also knew the research would provide lessons so that others could live. Once again, her mantra was, never give up, never give in. She had toughness, persistence, tenacity, and an unfailing optimism in the face of adversity. I believe it came from her own compelling and often riveting story. It was that personal story that brought us together. You see, Mr. President, we were both from European ethnic backgrounds. She Italian. I have my proud Polish heritage. We grew up in neighborhoods that were urban villages. Her father owned a small neighborhood dime store. My father owned a grocery store, very much involved with our customers and community. We had strong mothers who really wanted to make sure we had good educations. And when Jerry's dad died, Jerry's mother took a job in the garment industry, and she sewed little beads on wedding dresses to make sure her brother and Jerry had an education. Jerry did have that education. She went to Marymount. She became a scholarship girl because she was so smart and had so much talent. And she felt that it was the nuns who played such a big part in her life. They coached her to be smart, and they coached her to be a great debater, and they taught her about her faith. You see, for her, her faith was about the Beatitudes, especially the one that said, hunger and thirst after, after justice. The other day when Jerry and I were talking, she reminded me that not only did she go to Marymount, but so did Lady Gaga. And she said, I'm just sorry I can't live to go to more alumni associations. And then there was John, her beloved husband. A love story for the ages. I was there at this church just over a year ago when they renewed their vows for their 50th anniversary. Their vows were not just for a day or for a year, for a decade. You see, they believed that their vows are for eternity. And Jerry loved her husband and she loved her children, Donna, John, and Laura. And she was so proud of them. 
one a doctor, one an accomplished businessman, another a TV producer, and also had worked on Wall Street. And oh my gosh, the grandchildren. There was always the pictures and the stories of many storied accomplishments. You see, Jerry Ferrero loved her family. She loved her extended family that went to her friends and her community, and she loved America because she believed, as she said to me, only in America, Barbara, would somebody who started out in a, in a regular neighborhood, whose father passed away, and a mother who taught her grit and determination uh, could go on to be the Vice President of the United States, to be an ambassador on human rights, and to make a difference in the lives of her family and her community. Jerry, we will miss you, but your legacy will live forever.